at that. We're only three minutes late. Um, good to see you all. Welcome to the first English Bible study. I'm going to welcome you on the open event, but I thought I'd open in prayer first. So if you'd all like to bow your heads. Lord, we just want to ask today that you would give us ears to listen. Lord, that uh, you would give us focus and, and peace as we as we listen to this message from Yanni, Lord. Uh, mm. Lord, we ask that you would give him the uh, the words to speak, and Lord, that they would fall on our ears and, and really affect us today. Mm. Lord, we ask that your your message would be heard, that your words would be heard, and um, that we'd all walk away with something today. In your name, Amen. amen. All right, if you'd like to come up and everyone welcome Yanni. Okay, so let's try to, I have, this is the beautiful thing about speaking, is that you try to condense a lot into very short time. So we're going to be very concise, try to go to the point, and uh, we're going to be speaking about covenants and God. But let's turn our Bibles directly to Revelations we're going to go to the deep end of the pool immediately. Revelations 19. And then we go there to verse 13. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. Who are we speaking about here? Jesus. So when Jesus comes back, the scriptures reveal that his name is the word of God. So no wonder when you open the word of God, the spirit of the world will reject it immediately it, because it recognizes that the word of God is also the name of his son. So the word of God will always go against the spirit of this world. And that's why op opening the Word of God is you're opening the life of Jesus and also the God-given um, design for, for you and me just from the beginning, from creation to us and the story of Israel and the covenants that God has made. But when we speak about covenants, this is a picture of our galaxy. Do you know where we are here? We, 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 we are located somewhere here. Think about it. Everything that you know, everyone that you've ever known, everything what you felt, your history, your family line, everything, is right there somewhere. This little, little blue dot called planet Earth. And that's where God says that I've made this and I'm going to put you in it. So everything that you know, we're there somewhere. But you know, the world tells you that this everything came from nothing. Keep believing. That requires more belief than believing in what the scripture says. So, but about the beginning, we're going to go to very known uh, biblical scriptures. Why? Because... We need to be reminded. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There you go. The Word was God. Who was with God? Jesus. Jesus is there. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Then, in the beginning... God created everything, what do we know? And then it says that he created light. In Hebrew, it's the word or. Or means what? Order. Have you ever noticed that in the creation, when God created light, order came? Because it says that everything was in this order. So order equals light. Now when Jesus says, you're going to be my light and salt on earth. What does it mean? Light doesn't mean only light, something that is visible. It means order. So we are to bring his order on earth. 
How does the, the only thing that the disciples asked from Jesus to teach? What was the only thing that they requested to teach us? Is how to pray. That was the only thing that the disciples requested from Jesus to teach them. How does that prayer go? May your... Where? As it is. We are to bring his order on earth as it is in heaven. So God is a God of order. That has to do with light. You are his light, but light also exposes. So when you bring order, it's going to expose things. Not from the outside, mainly from yourself. Mainly from yourself. Now, I want to shed some light about covenants versus contracts. God doesn't make contracts. He makes covenants. Now, the difference between a contract and a covenant is quite drastic. Because... A contract is a deal. It is negotiated by two entities. It requires two entities. And you negotiate. So let's say that I make a contract with Curry. He gives me something and I give him something. It's an exchange. Now if we break that contract or deal, there's going to be consequences. Right? We're going to go to court. And then the judge is going to put... The knob down, and the consequences will come. But we are going to negotiate the contract before that. So it's bilateral. Contracts are always bilateral. A covenant is unilateral. It's made by one, one entity. He involves another entity. Because at the beginning, when we read about Moses, uh, sorry about Abraham, he was sleeping. When God made a covenant with him, sleeping. Did he have any say to that? No. Was there any voting? No. It wasn't a democracy. That's one big thing that we need to be reminded in the West. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. It's a kingdom. We, we don't vote about stuff. Back in the days when we had old school kingdoms, when the king spoke, his word became the law. And beside him, there was always a man or a woman who was writing everything what the king said because his word became the law to everybody. This is the king speaking. This is how we're supposed to live. And whatever he says sticks forever. Doesn't change. So... One side makes it, one side makes the rules, and then if you break it, God is going to still stick with it. That, is, that should be very comforting for us. Because I don't know about your level of spirituality. My level is it's not that perfect, you know. I have broken against God many times. Well, thank God, God has never broken His side. It's called faithfulness. He's faithful. That's why John 3.16 has nothing to do with your level of obedience. You don't have to read that much church history to know that the church is a messed up thing. I was born in a country called Uruguay where the, the church came and by the sword, put the sword on the necks of the, of the people. You converted, your head was not rolling. You did not, your head was rolling on the street. ISIS like executions. So the question is if God's covenants are tied to how well we are executing or how well are we um, performing, then John 3.16 is no longer valid on us. The church is a messy affair. I always say that the church stopped being perfect the first day the first person entered it. So God keeps his covenants. And the Bible is full of them. I just read today Psalm 105, verse 1.
verse 8 to 10. He says, he keeps his covenants. What was the word? Forever. Forever means actually forever. There is no expiration date, like a milk can or whatever. It never goes bad. Ever. Now, this isn't finished. When God builds anything, and when you build any building, what is the first thing that you need to lay down on, on, on the table? What, what is the first thing you need to draw? Yeah. You need to put a blueprint, right? A blueprint will have its foundations. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever gone, let's say, to any big monumental building, historical building? Have you ever wondered a castle or anything? You're like, wow, wow. Amazing. How many times have you gone, let's say, to um, a skyscraper and you're like, you're looking down and you're like, wow, foundations, amazing. <laughs> when was the last time you went and you wondered the foundations of the building? We, as human beings, we like to see what's visible. God looks what's invisible. He looks here. We, we, uh, we get very uh, emotional and in awe about external things. God sees what's non-visible. Foundations are never visible. But the foundations are the very reason why the building can stand up. Even this building has its foundations. They're not visible. Somebody laid them down. And foundations are never changed. They stick. They don't change. Covenants are God's foundations. He builds everything on top of them. Why? Because they are unshakable, unmovable, and they, can, and they sustain everything on top of them. No foundations, nothing stands up. So that's why it's very important to understand the, different, the difference between contracts and covenants. Now, the, the very good question that I, I get asked a lot is then... Why does God make covenants? Well, I just tell you a few reasons. But the main reason is because through covenants, God tells to the world who He is. His character is exposed through His covenants. God doesn't make things just for our emotional benefit. No, 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 no. He exposes His character through his covenants. God makes covenants because he doesn't break his promises. He does not lie. He does not get tired. He's not unholy. He does not start something he cannot finish. He cannot stop loving. He cannot change. He cannot change his word. He, can, he cannot be bought. And he does not reject anyone who is sincere. If you look at this list, and the list is much longer actually, all of these things are exposed through his covenants. Everything. Now the question is, we as human being, beings, we make promises, right? Have you ever made a promise? Have you broken a promise? Yeah. And many times when we are hurt, and our character is wounded, we start to look at God through our own lenses and not through His lenses. And that changes our perception, and perceptions are very important. Perceptions are like these glasses. If they're broken, scratched, they're going to distort my view. I'll give you an example about perception. What do you see? What is this? It's a credit card. So I see the credit card too, right? The question is, do you, three, do you see the three pin numbers, which are the very important numbers from the back? No. no. Because you have your perspective. God sees everything. That's God's perspective. We have a very limited perspective of Him and also His work. Because we are beings in a time, in a time period. 
but he exposes himself through his covenants that he has openly done with human beings. So, the history of God's people. Why do we call it God's people? Why do we call it God's people? Because he chose them. He chose them. And that's something that we as human beings, we don't like. It bothers us. Choosing is a thing that in our human intellect is that somebody's better than other. Why did God choose Cody to be a millionaire when my resume is much better? Look at my life, God. Look at how I've handled my life. Why him? Why not me? That's how we perceive choice. Now, that's why many people think that he chose the people of Israel. Are we now somehow second, second best? No. He chooses because he knows. And actually, he chose his people because the scripture says that they were, they were one of the least. One of the least. Not one of the best. One of the, unfor- the forgotten ones. The, the very troublemakers. Very hard-headed. You live in Israel, you will realize. Jews? Oh. Hard-headed. You can read it in the scriptures. So when they succeed, the world around them knows that it's not because of them. It's because of who chose them. That's the whole point. But we as human beings, we look at choice as better. Because that's how we choose. Let me ask you a question. If you have a company, who would you choose to be employees? The better ones or, or the worst ones? The better ones. That's, that's how we make choices. And yes, there's a lot of wisdom. You, you, you are supposed to make good choices, right? But God's choices operate on a whole different level whole different level. After Noah, God still gives humanity freedom of choice. That's mercy right there. I would have not done that. I would have made people robots. I'm going to tell them how to do things and they have no free will because they just messed it up. So that's an act of love to give free will. And we can see that free will being exercised in the Old Testament by the people of God. Not always in very great ways. But I I just only have to look in the mirror every morning and I can see the same thing. I have not always exercised God's wisdom in my life. So the history of God's people. The main themes that we can find is that God gives hope, he calls, a man answers, and a nation is born. God calls people. If you think that you're here this morning here by chance, no chance. There are no chances in in the kingdom of God. Maybe God forced you to come here, but it was actually God. Because God either wants to teach you something or remind you something. That's how he operates. Most of the time in my life, he wants to remind me about things that I have forgotten. In Finnish, we have a good saying that the the greatest rule of teaching is to be reminded. It's to be reminded. Now, when we go to this time, what what do you see? This is the the Tower of Babel. How does this have anything to do with the the people of God? Well, this era was an era that humanity wanted to be above God. They wanted to build something greater and to show the fist directly to God. We know better than you. And we can read... That in this time, actually the book of Romans speaks that these times are times that are going to be 
around humanity for a long time. If you look at the time where we're living now, it says that the same depravity, the scripture says that there's a time that came that are going to be like the times when Jesus comes, like the days of Noah. In Hebrew, sky means shamaim. It means water up there. Maim, water, sha, up there. Shamaim. Water is up there. It's actually it's true. It's, the sky is full of water. The biggest fear back then was that the shamaim comes with no control on earth. That's exactly what God did. Water came down from earth, from, from heavens, down to earth to judge. Have you ever thought the, the sign that God made after that? What, what is it called? Uh, what does it mean? Rain bow. The rain was a bow of God to execute judgment. And that rainbow is a sign that the bow of rain will not come back again. And there's a movement that have taken that to show the fist to God again. Like this. That is the bow of God. It's in His Word. He created everything with His Word. And He can do anything He wants. When we look at This city, this is the city where Abram was from, the city of Ur. Today's Iraq. What is what God does with this man? We can find it directly from the scriptures. You can go to Genesis chapter 3, verse right. Sorry, uh, chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 3. Actually, verse 1. Let me go it in English. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, Ur, which was a very wealthy, well-organized, nice city. That's already God saying to him, Things are going to change. Things are going to change for you. And your kindred and your father's house to the land with I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Think about that calling in that city. That, that calling probably seemed like this is, this is crazy. What do you mean all the families of the earth are going to know my name? And that all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through me? What is this? And I'm supposed to leave from here? Where? That's why, because Abraham left, he's called the father of faith. Because I don't know about you, but my prayers many times are like this. God, show me where to go so I can go. Abram left without knowing where to go. How many of you would go without knowing where to go? <laughs> and on top of it, just to illustrate to you, Ur is here. It was a, a city, well, well structured, very wealthy city. What do you mean, God, that this is not your, you're, you're blessing me, right? I'm supposed to be this in abundance, right? Because we in the West, we think that blessing is abundance of material. No, no, no. Abundance of His will. That's the true blessing. Paul was blessed when he was in jail. How many of us would, you know, say that, oh, what a blessed life you're in jail. He's left 
he goes, and this is called what they call the, the, the half moon, because it was the green area, so he didn't go directly through Jerusalem, through the desert. He would have died immediately. He went through the green area. Yeah. It's, it's the luscious area. Now, he goes without knowing. That's faith. That's faith. In Hebrews 11, the, the chapter of faith has a few things to say about that. And that is something interesting, that Hebrews 11 speaks about all the patriarchs of God moving in faith. Not law. Faith. And many times we read the Old, script, the, the old Testament thinking, oh, legalistic, oh, oppressive. Oh, they were working all, only with the law. Well, there's no problem in the law. The law is perfect. The law is given by God. The problem is not the law. The problem is us who cannot keep the law. That's the problem. And this, when we go from Abraham then to King David, this is the area where the kingdom of Israel was at its biggest. Well, this is what it is today. According to international law and international uh, very highly opinionated people, this land is not, it's not even theirs. We're going to say a few things about that. But basically, God makes a covenant with a man and promises to this one man a future, a family, a descendant, and the nations. Not just any, any promise. What if God would tell you that you're the next president or the next prime minister of Australia? Would that seem a bit impossible at the moment? Yeah. yeah. And that through you, all the nations will be blessed. That's like an irrational thing to you. Like, what? what do you mean, God? And you, 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 need to, you need to go. You need to leave. Where? To the place that I will show you. So move in faith, and I will move then. You take the first step, and God will guide you the next one. So the, how God operates is He chooses individuals from which comes families, tribes, and nations, and the world. That's His operational model. He chooses individuals. Always. Because through individuals, He does His work. He chose you. From millions, you're a winner. From millions, you were given life. You're not a coincidence. You are His unique design on earth. Abraham, his name is changed to Abraham. In Finnish there, it says that Abraham means an elevated father. But Abraham means the father of a great multitude. So God changes his perspective even to his own name. That's why we can see in the scriptures that God changes people's names according to the calling. It's not like in the West we name kids according to what sounds nice. No, 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 no. God changes the people's name according to what's your trajectory of life. Your, your calling is your name. Now, Yitzhak, Isaac. That's the promise, your offspring, which he didn't have. Now, the interesting thing about Isaac, I'm not going to go even to the details, is that when Abraham is called to go and sacrifice Isaac. That is the first time in the scriptures where the word love is mentioned. Go and sacrifice the son who you love. So God is testing, who do you love most? Who is the highest in your hierarchy of love? 
An interesting thing is that in that very mountain, Mount Moriah, is where God sacrifices His Son for the sins of the world. Isaac had to go and carry the wood. Jesus had to carry His wood. When we speak about covenants, this is a very key word in Hebrew. Berit. Let's say it all together. Berit. Berit means cutting. To cut. There's also a few other words, but this, this specific word, to cut, is what God does through covenants. He called another individual, called Moshe. Moses. What does the word Moshe mean? Do you know? Remember, God names people with their calling. It means to pull. Moshe was pulled from the water. His calling was to pull the people of Israel from slavery. And Berit is to cut. Cut means dividing. To separate. God cut Abram for his purpose. He cut Moses for his purpose. Through Moses, he cut his entire people to their own nation. Berit. And when you cut, there's always one thing involved, which is blood. That's why in God's sacrificial system, blood has to be always involved in covenants. Always. It's not because he's fond to blood. No, no, no. It's you need to understand the meaning of blood. That's why God, his son had to shed blood on the cross for your sins and my sins. I'll ask you a very, I'm a very direct guy. What is the only covenant that you're going to enter in your life willingly? Marriage. It's not a contract. This world tries to tell you that it's a contract. No, 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 no. It's a covenant. In Finnish, we have even a crazy word which have, they said. In Finnish, uh, avioliitto is marriage. Now there's another term which is Avolito, which means open marriage. What do you mean open? Marriage is a closed circuit. It's designed by God. Now the devil takes everything what God has done and distorts it. He's not a creator. God is. He takes what God has created and distorts it. Everything. From marriage to family life, even to the creation itself. The word says he made man and woman to his image. Even that very section is being manipulated. God gave the people of Israel his law because he wanted to give them a new operating system. How many of you have a phone and you need to have updates at times? Let me ask you a question. How many of you really, now answer honestly. How many of you ever read the legal jargon which comes that you just scroll? Have you ever read it? But you press accept, right? We're crazy. We accept things that we don't know. The question is, people do the same thing with God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Except. We have responsibilities. Because we have free will, we also have responsibilities. And the new operating system that God gives to His people through Moshe, through Moses, 
is that you will live differently to, compared to the other nations. You're not going to kill. You're not going to make any false gods. You're going to honor your father and mother. So when you live this way, all the other nations will know that you, people, you live differently. I will reiterate my question. When you live according to this word, do you live differently? Yeah. You're going to be noticed because you even speak differently. That's the operating system that God wanted to give to his people. Not, not to, to be picky. God is not a picky God. Oh, you see, now they're breaking what I've said. No, it's for your benefit, for your good. Now, the covenant with Moses has conditions. The Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. The Mosaic covenant is conditional. It has conditions. Because in the Mosaic covenant we can read, if you break my word, there's X things that I'm going to do. So now the Ten Commandments actually give you this inner voice. Have you ever had this inner voice when you do something against God? Yeah. And it's, that is actually something good. Because it's like an inner radar system that detects sin. That's grace. To know when you're going against God. Think about if you, don't, you wouldn't have it. You would go full blast. You can read in Exodus. I, I have them finished. But in Exodus and Deuteronomy, it says the Mosaic Covenant has its blessings and its curses. You obey me, you will be blessed. If you disobey me, I'm going to curse you. That's why Moses, just before departing, he goes and says to his people, you have to choose. Life and death is right in front of you. You have to choose. You choose with my word, I will bless you. You choose against me, consequences come in your way. Moses doesn't even have time to come down from the mountain and the people are already worshiping a false god. 3,000 men die right there. And many times we read the scriptures, oh, you need, see, the Jews. What can you do, you know? And we elevate ourselves somehow that we're better. I don't know about you, but I find myself many times being in meetings in church meetings where God really touches you. And you're like, you know, God, I'm going to go outside this, these doors and whole Brisbane is going to come to Christ. We barely walk outside the door and we have forgotten half of the things that God said to us. That should be a, a, a very bright reminder to us that we need to be careful with what God speaks to us because when God speaks to you now you're responsible cursed is everyone who does not do according to the law the law is merciless let me ask a question you probably have laws here in Australia right yeah, yeah, okay. so let me ask you a question how many of you wake up every morning in complete disarray, half, you know, crying on the ground? Why? Why do I need to obey the laws of Australia? <laughs> None of us. Actually, they secure you the way you can live. When you go to the traffic, there's a thing called traffic laws, right? They secure you. That nobody's going to go head collision to you just right outside the corner. But when you disobey the laws, what comes? What is the job of the police? The traffic police is to find you. And then if you do wrong enough, you will go to court, right? And what is the job of the judge? 
Is it to give you mercy? No. The law is merciless. The law is tough. So now that people know, you break my commandments, consequences come in your way. How many of you have kids? Have you had to teach them disobedience or does it come by nature? <laughs> Let me ask you another question. Have you had to repeat them the same thing many times? Yeah. You laugh because you know it's, it's millions of times. That's what God does with us. He has to remind us time and time again about the same old, same old, same old. Reminding. And because you love your kids, you give them rules. Honey, I love you. I know you are a very good climber. But please do not go to the roof and jump from the roof. Because I love you. That's what God's intention with the law is to protect us. But we, through our flesh, we, we have started to discern, oh, you know, this is to be picky. It, it restricts me. What do you mean? No, no, it protects you. I see the same thing with my kids. Honey, please don't eat that one kilo of candy. It's not good for you. Why, Dad? I like them. Because I tell you so. You might not understand. Later on you will. That is exactly the same thing that God does with us. And we fight with God. I don't know about you, but I've lost every single one of them. Every single one of them. Then comes the Davidic covenant. The, the, the covenant that God made with David. King David. And here we can read... I know it's a very tiny uh, font, but in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 to 16, I have highlighted with blue all the places where God says, I. God refers to himself. I will do this. I will put you. Don't think that it's you. It's me. And I, it says at the end, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. What do you mean forever? Here God is already speaking about Jesus. Because Jesus has to come from the bloodline of David. It's no coincidence that Jesus is Jew. It was his father's will. Remember, a person, a family, a tribe, a nation, and the world. God is setting up his ultimate peak through a people this is God's way and when John the Baptist sees Jesus he understands something about God the God's sacrificial system if there's one person that knew the sacrificial system of the temple it was John the Baptist he sees God and he immediately recognizes Look, this is the Lamb of God who will die and His blood will be shed like the Lamb's blood for all the people of the world. It doesn't say only for the Jews, right? It says for all. John is declaring at that very moment that this is the man who's going to die for all of us. All of us. Because in the godly sacrificial system of the temple... Lambs had to be sacrificed. It is no coincidence that on this day, Good Friday, in Finland is called Long Friday, Pitka Beriantai. Do you know that in the temple, when they sacrificed the lamb, where did this lamb, where did they come from? Any guess? Bethlehem. They took always all the lamb from Bethlehem. And you, you know that what the word Bethlehem means. Beit Lachem. The house of bread. He's the sacrificial lamb 
who comes from Bethlehem, and he's the word that is the bread of life who is going to die for all of us. And this is where I want to end. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 to 14. This pretty much sums up 4,000 years of biblical history in just a few verses. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Why? For it is written, cursed is cursed by everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before, before God by the law, because we cannot keep it. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather than the one who does, who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written... Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. This is written right at the beginning verses of the scriptures. So it is no coincidence that Jesus dies on a tree, on a wood, on a piece of wood. Because God is showing that I will keep what I have said. My son is going to die just like it's written. The one who's cursed is going to die on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So that's why everyone who believes in Christ is saved. Abraham, Moshe, David, Yeshua. What is the one thing that they all have in common? They are all Jews. They're all Jews. In Jesus, it's like this. I would imagine four men here. All of them are past one bottle where God injects all of his blessings, all of his promises. And that bottle is passed from one generation to the next. And that bottle comes to Jesus. That bottle has been with the Jewish people for, for 2,000 years. Jesus opens the, the, the lid and drinks it and gives it to the Gentiles. Through me, to Christ, all of you can now receive the promise of faith given to them. Now it is open for all of you. So we, through Christ, can own the blessings given to the Jewish people. But we do not replace them. We do not replace them. That is what replacement theology tells you. That now the blessings are with the Gentiles and the curses stay with the Jews. No, it's not correct. Nowhere in the scriptures you can find replacing anything from, with other. I'll give you a question. Where can you find in the scriptures a place where... The promise of the land is being replaced and given to somebody else. Nowhere. That's why the world wants to take that land. To show we, we are above you. God takes his promises seriously. The spirit of the world wants to destroy his promises. Because Jesus said, I will come back to the same place where I left. The same place. Many Christians are completely okay believing that Jesus went up, rose up to heaven from the Mount of Olives. But many have a big problem believing that he will come back to the same place. How? Because it's Jesus. 
Jesus can come back and, and go up in the air however he wants. But our mind, our modern mind, goes against supernatural. Has to be rational. Has to be scientifically proven. How can you scientifically prove that Jesus rose from the death? Or that he healed Lazarus from death to life? Prove that to me scientifically. Impossible. So it's about faith. Faith in Christ and understanding that God gave this piece of land to his people as an everlasting covenant. And then I will speak a bit more about Romans 11. Which then opens up the the tension that the promises and the works of Christ now are, we're living in that time. We're living in the time of huge tension. So I will open that a bit later, but time is up. So individual, family, tribe. This is a tribe. You are a tribe of faith. Nation, your job is to touch this nation. And that this nation blesses the people of Israel. Blesses everyone who bless my people. Not because oh, we, ble- we will bless them if they're good. No. You bless them because the word of God says so. Do you pray that God will touch Australia? Is Australia perfect? But you still believe that God can touch Australia, right? It's the same thing with the Jewish people. We pray for the people of Israel, even though the people of Israel commit sin. Amen? Amen. Thank you.